Okay, so well, now we're recording. So I want to prove this, right? First of all, if I prove this, am I proving that it's at most n squared? Suppose I succeed with that. Would I get what I want that's at most n squared? Yes. Yes. Obviously, this is theta of n squared. Right? It's a polynomial, it's theta of n squared. Uh, but then, more mathematically speaking, can I prove this versus what I tried to prove here? How is this, 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 this upper bound versus the one I tried to prove here? Uh, let's say D, sorry, because we use D on this side. So I couldn't prove it's smaller than D n squared, but somehow maybe I can prove it's smaller than D n squared minus D n. Which one seems a harder thing to do? This one, right? This, you're trying to prove that it's smaller than something that's smaller than this. <coughs> Yet, if you think about polynomials, this free term is going to help us out. So let's try to redo this part here. How would this work? Again, so we're going to have a base case. It needs to be figured out. What would be my induction step? <coughs> if d of n by 2 is smaller than n by 2 square minus d n by 2, then d of n is smaller than hmm. OK, well, let's see if we can make this work. Um, d of n is like before, 4 d of n by 2 plus n. So now I apply the induction hypothesis on t of n by 2. That is 4 smaller than what? d n over 2 squared minus d n over 2, right? Plus n. This is the induction hypothesis applied on t of n by 2. So how much is this thing? 4d n by square by 2 squared d n squared minus 2 d n minus 2 d n plus n. And what do we want? I'm going to say want. We would like this to be smaller than d n squared minus d n. So let's remove the terms that can be removed. Isn't d n squared goes away with d n squared, right? So that's equivalent with n smaller than d n, right? Do you agree? Because two oranges in this side minus one orange. It's one orange. And this uh, n stays here. d n squared goes away with d n squared, right? I don't have to worry about this. So this is still a want. But if I get this to work, that will work too, because they're equivalent. So how do I make this to work? The equivalent, I need a d that's at least 1. So choose d, da, da, da. Now, when you choose the actual d, you have to look at base cases. Maybe the base cases put a constraint on the d. Typically, there's a constraint coming from here, like I need d at least 1, and a constraint coming from the base case. And in most cases, there is a way to satisfy both constraints. If there is not, means you can, you can find the right d. So I'm not going to insist on the base cases now, because I want to move on. But when you actually pick the d for real, you're going to have to look at whatever you need in the induction proof and what you need in the base case. Okay. So um, there is a part of mathematics that explains why this 
stronger statement, this is a more strict statement, it's actually more provable. You know? Sounds counterintuitive. If I try to prove something harder, it should be harder to prove. Yet this stuff works while that one is not. Has to do with the nature of polynomials. The part that I don't have here is I can't deal with this n. Right? I get a dn square. It aligns OK with this other dn square. But n, which is a smaller term degree-wise, right? Degree-wise, this is degree 1. This is degree 2. It, it left, it, it's completely in the air. It's degree 1, which is small, versus nothing. So that's why if I subtract a little bit, by a little bit, it's something that I can actually control because d applies to this one too. So I subtract more than 1n. I subtract 1.1 or y.2 ns. Then the su subtraction here would allow me to not have this n as a free term. And there's even fancier methods than that. But this is something to do with how polynomials work. So uh, sometimes the guess is right, but, but the, the, the intuition of the proof needs more than the trivial case. OK, um, that's this method for which I, I just put up a guess out of the blue. See here, the guesses that I have, I didn't explain how to get them. Now I want to go back to the other method, the so-called iteration method, and say, could I have guessed or could I have solved this with the iteration method? Remember the iteration method or the brute force? It forces the recurrence two, three, four times until you figure out the pattern. At that point, if you can solve it rigorously, you're done. If you cannot solve it rigorously, maybe you at least get the guess so you can do it. So let's try to do this one that way. Iteration slash brute force. Um, T of n is 4t of n by 2 plus n, right? So now if I apply the recurrence again on n by 2, maybe we did this last time? Yeah, yeah. I think we did. Right? So actually, we did the whole thing. Let's not repeat it. That's coming up of theta of n squared. Right? I, I just remember that I think we did this last time. Okay. Uh, the one thing that we can do here, actually, we, we need a little bit of the, the first part. So this is 1, and then we say this is 4 p of what was it? n by 4 plus n. So that came out as 16 p of n by 4 plus n. And then if I am to do this again, 16 4 t n by 8 plus n by 4 plus 3 n. So that will be 64. Pn by plus 7. So some people prefer to see this in a tree. So the way you think about it, you start with P of n right here. This is the same thing, just represented with a tree instead of with algebra. And you think about in terms of computer science. Right? You think about the divide and conquer. So what is the computer going to do to solve this problem? It's going to split it into <coughs> four sub-problems or smaller problems of size. So then you draw the branches and say, okay, there are four guys here. Right? And uh, actually, let me draw them nicer, four of them. So this is T of n by 2, T of n by 2. P of n by 2, P of n by 2, right? And additionally, so I have those four sub-problems to solve. And I have n. also an extra n computation. So I can put it here, plus n, if I want to. I want to do this informally. I think the book does it more formally. I don't care about these trees other than your intuition for why and how it works. So now, recursively, now you are the computer, you are the machine. What happens when you try to solve this problem? 
<laughs> Divided into four problems, right? Each one of them is <laughs> d of n by 4. d of n by 4. And this one is four things, right? All of them are d of n by 4. This one is four things. d of n by 4. And this one here is four things. d of n by 4. <coughs> And what happens to the overall volume? Uh, um, I, could, I could just add up the, the additional non-cumulative. See, this 7n is cumulative here. But in fact, what this is, is the 3n from before, right? Plus how many n's are new here? 4n plus, right? So this is the old stuff, and that's the new additional load. So if I only want to say here, how much new stuff I have, what do I get? 4n, 2n, 2n, right? And then, of course, each one of them becomes four things. So on and so forth, right? And then I get another 4n. So the way we figure out the general pattern, remember last time we said, what's the general pattern here? I think we, we, we get that. Uh, what was it? It was 4 to the k, d over n to the 2 to the k, right? Yes. yes. Plus? T power k minus 1. Like that? Like that. Maybe? I don't remember exactly, but something like this. This has to do with if I decompose these three k times. Same thing. It's, it's how this stuff going to look like, right? This general pattern would be present in here. And this would be the two, this is one, two, four. This is probably going to be two to the k minus one times n. Because when I add those two those together, I'm going to get the overall two to the k minus one. <laughs> so I'm not saying you need to use the three. But sometimes to represent in your mind, so see, the people who are good at mathematics, they probably gonna like to think this way. The people who are not so good at mathematics, but they understand better how programming works, which is totally fine in this class. This is not a mathematics class. If you feel a little, okay, I, I'm not that good at math, that's okay. You can think about it this way. That's how computers break up the problems, right? And then uh, you should get the same exact thing. The question in here is, how many branches I have, how many total branches I have at row k here? We already did this. The total number, the, the t itself would be n divided by 2 to the k. How many of them will be across the entire level here? 4 to the k of them, right? And if I cumulatively sum up those things, I should get 2 to the k minus 1 times that. So then, what's going to happen at the very end? Remember what we say here. What was the stopping condition? Figure out where to stop. I need this guy inside to be about 1. So I'm going to say I need n to be about 2 to the k. That means k to be about log base 2 of n. So in here, we know we're going to get eventually to 2 to the 1. But the question is how many of the, those guys we're going to have. How many 2 to the 1's are going to be here. So in this, in this and the last, uh, the, if you want here the same, the stop line, there's two things that matter. How many 2 to the 1's are here? And what's the total load on this side? So there will be some sort of, okay, you get a number of 2 to the 1's, let's say, you know, the count, plus the cumulative load. That's all this. And we did this algebraically. We know we get 4 to the k, t to the 1's, and 2 to the k minus 1 times n. Now we can plug in the last k and figure out what it is. These terms are competing 
for the dominance here. In some recurrences, this term is going to be the one that dictates the value because it's going to be bigger. In some other recurrences, it's going to be this term that dictates the dominance. Because in, in, in this particular case, uh, what was it? Was both n squares? N squared plus n squared. Right, so I think it was n squared and n squared. Right, so this is about n squared. I'm going to say theta of n squared plus theta of n squared. In this case, they're the same order. It's going to be theta of n squared. But in general, you have to play with those two two competing factors. A lot of recurrences come come up to that. How many of the the normal Q of one or two or zero terms, neutral terms you get, versus what's the overall load? Okay. So um, there's some details here. I would like to show you guys one more, and then. Um, talk about how to solve those recurrences in general. <coughs> Let's see. What can we do here? P of n is n squared <laughs> plus T of n by 2 plus T of n by 4. It's a little bit more complicated because there are two terms in there. So in terms of divide and conquer, it splits into a problem that's half, a problem that's a quarter, and n squared sometime to combine the results perhaps. Uh, so let's see what happens if we try to brute force this with iteration to, to get, try to figure out the pattern, right? Uh, this is n squared plus, I'm going to uh, start working out the recurrence of those terms here. So what is this? n by 2 squared plus plus, how about this? Let's put the n by n by fourth first plus t of oh I mean something here t of n by eight right this is a t of n by eight plus t of n by sixteen that right so let's count see what we have total we have. How many n squares we have? <coughs> There's a one plus one fourth plus one sixteen, right? That's how many n squares we have. One n square, a one fourth of n square, and a one sixteen of n square. Plus how many t of n by four? One t of n by four plus Two t of n by eight plus one t of n by sixteen. Okay. So that was the first step. Now suppose I try to apply the recurrence again. It's gonna get like a monster here now. Okay. So I have this n square one plus one fourth plus one sixteen plus what happens to t of n by four? n fourth <coughs> square plus t of n by eight plus okay. What about this guy? n by eight n by <laughs> a 
last guy. N by 16 plus T N by 32. T of N by 32 plus T of N by 64. So now, again, I'm going to count the N squares. How many N squares do I have? I have 1 plus 4 plus 16 from before. 1 plus 1, 4 plus 1, 16. But now I've got a few more N squares. What is this? 1 by 16. How about 2T of N by 8? 1 by 32. 1 by 32. And how about this? Plus, what up, what's up with the t's? I have a t of n by 8 right here. Plus, how many t of n by 16? Uh, this is a 2 applied to everybody, right? So it's a 3t of n by 16 plus t of 3. 3t of n by 32 plus 16. Suppose we apply this again. <laughs> I'm going to write down the results. Uh, and you can check it out. Here's what I've got here on my paper. Again, that's something that I, I think you need to understand the main concept that's critical. Calculations are, you know, different people are different good at calculations. Some people make more mistakes than others, but, but mistakes are not as critical as understanding the main principle of what's going on here. So here's what I have on my paper. N squared, of course, times, uh, turns out there's a formula here. 1 plus 516 plus 516 squared plus 516 to the cube. So those are the n squares. We should check that formula to see if that, that happens here. So this is after I, I do one more time. One more iteration. Plus the number of t's I have is uh, t of n by 16 plus 4t of n by 32 plus 6t of n by 64 plus 4t of n by 128 plus t of n by 56. Uh, what I would like to verify with you is if this, what I have here, kind of, can, can I make it to look like that? So my speculation is that if for one more iteration I get this kind of uh, progression here, that was also through the previous round. So let's see. Can I say that this whole parenthesis here is in fact 1 plus 5 over 16? Plus 5 over 16 squared? Is that true? Easy to say yes. Without <laughs> one is the one. Okay, so that's good. How about 5 over 16? What do I get this? First two? Yeah. 5 over 16? Yeah. I need you guys to pay attention. Can, can all the way in the back? Is it clear that 1 fourth plus 1 over 16 is actually 5 over 16? Yes. Right. How about this? This is what if I open the squares? This guy is 25 by 256. So that's 1 of the 25. How many? This is 8. I need to multiply with 8 to get to 56. And this I need to multiply with 16. So 16 plus 8 plus 1. 
gives me the 25 here. So that's exactly like before when we say do it a few times to figure out the pattern. Now I think we could guess the pattern of this, this recurrence. What is this? Is this like 1 plus r plus r squared plus r cubed plus plus some r to some power d? What is, this is a, what? How is it called? <coughs> Geometric? <coughs> Progression. Right? Uh, and it has a formula. You can apply the formula, get the answer. How about this part? This looks like a Pascal coefficient, right? But it's not a binomial formula, but it does look like a Pascal coefficient. So now, um, I, could, I could say, okay, I can figure out a formula like this, maybe, right? It has, I can figure out that this load, I think that's easy. That's going to be, what's going to be the load without this? N squared times the geometric progression with the base, how much is my R? 5 by 16. How about the T's remaining after every round? Is this sort of binomial coefficients, right? With the T's over, it's not just one T like before. Here we always have one T, right? In here we're going to have a bunch of T's. We're going to have a bunch of powers of 2 at the denominators. And if I expand it once, I'm going to get rid of t of n by 16 when I expand, but I'm going to add a few more terms that way. Hmm. I could try to write down this formula, but I'm not, I'm not sure that's going to help me right, that much. So in here, maybe I should draw that tree to see if I, if I build the tree, how the tree is going to look. Again, to what I said last time and today still stands. From here, if you could figure out the pattern and do it nicely and clean, you got your answer. If not, then at least we get a guess for what this is and try to prove it with induction. So how the tree looks like? P of n, right? Right here. It's gonna break into how does it break? D of n by two, D of n by four, and the load? What is it? N squared. N squared, right? That's the first recursion. Calls the two sub problems and then says to combine them you need plus that. How about we break this one now into what? <laughs> and the load was what? Was this, right? Now, this is the cumulative load. It includes the first n squared. So that's n squared times 1. That was from there. So what does it add? It adds n squared times 5 over 16. In here, we typically write only the additional load. But it's up to you. If you want to write it cumulatively, you can. Just make sure the reader understands what you're writing. Right? So I'm going to just say I have this n squared for before. And now I'm adding the 5 over 16 n squared. I'm lucky I figured out this pattern at least. The, see, I, I got half of it. I, I figured out the patterns, what's going to happen with the n squares. I'm pretty sure the next load in here will be? 5 over 16 squared. So that's nice. And the next one? 5 over 16? I got this right. And I know when I sum those up, it's a geometric progression, I know how to do that. What I didn't figure out is how many t's I have and of what kind. Is there a concise formula for to sum this up? So if I open it again, the next layer right here, what do I get? T 
Diop. <laughs> By 16, right? Yes. This one is? N. T of N by 32. This one is? N by 16, N by 32. Same. And this one is? 32. So that, that so this level here corresponds to the plus this, and this the next level corresponds to plus that. And now, I'm not going to do this, but I can open each one of those into two terms. I have more terms, of course, plus that. So, I'm not that good at this, me, Virgil. Uh, other people smarter than me can do this. <laughs> but I'm saying, I, I'm smart enough to figure out the load addition, but I'm not smart enough to figure out these T's in here. So I think I'm gonna give up on doing this clean, rigorously get an answer, and instead try to make a guess of what happens. So this is kind of k equals zero, right? Mm -hmm. This is k equals one, I split it once. Mm -hmm. This is k equals two, k equals three, k equal 4. So I'm going to ask how many of those t's without summing up, see I, this is grouped, this t of n by 64, it's all grouped into six of them. Suppose I don't group them. Suppose I look at them, how many individual oranges of different kinds here? Are, how many are here? 2 raised to k. Hmm? 2 raised to k. 2 to the k, right? Because each one of those broke into 2. So that's easy. The number of them <coughs> is 2 to the k. Okay? Now, what about the size? The biggest one of them is going to be what? This is the biggest one. 2 to the? So the biggest to be on this side? If I'm, if I'm a level k, the biggest one will be what? P of n of T of n divided by and the smallest t will be four to the k, right? Because this branch divides by four all the time. Now, of course, in the middle, it's a mix. But I'm saying this looks like a full binary tree. I know how many leaves are, right? And I know all the leaves are between. This is, this t is a monotonic function. So the smaller the argument, right? The, this is actually the smallest argument. The smaller the argument, the smaller the value is going to be. So let's just do a gross approximation and say I have 2 to the k terms. All terms are at least this and at most that. So this whole thing in here, the sum of the terms, is at least what? <laughs> 2 to the k, because there's 2 to the k of them, right? <laughs> times t times 2 to the k, right? That's the sum of t's. That's what I have. And it's at least, how many? Okay. 2 to the k, because 2 to the k of them, and each one of them is at least n by 4k. Okay. And the, the, this part, the, the right side, I can do exact. In fact, if I sum up a geometric progression, 1 plus r plus r squared <coughs> plus r cubed, in general, this is bounded, right? Yes. I mean, there's an exact formula that tells you it's about what? One, uh, one, one, one. r to the next power minus 1 divided by r minus 1, something like that. But the point is that that's pretty much a constant, whatever it is. So how much is going to be this whole thing? If this adds up to a constant times n squared, how much is that going to be? This C here is going to be some constant 
of times n squared. So I'm trying to make progress on my guess here. I have a bunch of these guys, these, and an n squared. I am back to that balancing between two factors, right? It comes down to what do I think those t's are going to be compared to n squared. If those guys are less than n squared, I don't have to worry about them, right? Because they, this is going to dominate. If they are bigger than n squared, then I do have to worry about them because they're going to dominate, and I need to know what are they, n squared log n, or n cubed, or what. But maybe they're smaller than n squared, and I don't have to worry about it. So what do you think? What is the story in there? So we know, like before, there's going to be a t of something like t of 1, right? So the, what's important here is the count, how many of them will be. If the number of them is smaller than n squared times some t of something that's a constant, then the domain, the, 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 what dictates the order of this is the how many t's you get. When? Of course, it's 2, 4, 8. 16, 32, but what really matters is the last line, right? So on the last line, how many of those things I'm going to have? What's the last k? By, by this guy, where k has to go? Log n. Log base 2. By this one, log base 4, right? So if I'm lenient, what's the maximum number I can have? If I go by this branch that goes down slower, right? Log k will be last k. Last k, it's at most log base 2 of n. It's actually smaller because this branch finishes earlier. But suppose it's that much. If this, if this is log base 2 of n, how many terms are here in the last line? N. N. Right, but that n or 2n is not going to dominate the n squared part. Right? This is an important thing that I need everybody to understand. Did I, did I do rigorously anything? No. I just tried to figure out in my head how does the sum of these compete with the sum of the free loads or the, the additional combination loads. Mm -hmm. I figured out this about n squared. Because I know it's n squared times the geometry progression, and the geometry progression adds up to a constant. That is, if r is smaller than 1. If this r is bigger than 1, then this goes to big numbers very quickly. But if r is smaller than 1, that goes to a constant times n squared. So that's n squared. And then I'm here, I'm saying, I don't know how to calculate this, like in a closed form. See, before I had a very nice expression that was telling me there is 2 to the k times t of n divided by 4 to k. Nice. In here, I don't know how to do that exact. But my gut feeling is that it's about n terms, maybe 2n or some linear number of terms. How do I do that? I say, how, how fast this tree is expanding? How many branches are left versus right? The right side quick finishes a lot quicker because it divides by four. But overall, the number of terms seems to be linear in here. Even if I go by the slow branch, it's still linear. So in that sense, I'm going to get n times something versus n squared. <coughs> so my guess is that n squared is going to dominate. So I can make a, a, a guess now. I could say, guess. P of n is theta of n squared. Now, that's not a proof. If you write this in the exam, even if your guess is correct, 
you still need something. It's obviously, this is not a mathematical proof. So what we effectively said here is that d of n is between d n square and c n square for some c and some d and some n zero, like before. Now, it turns out we don't need to prove both of them. In here, one of them is already proven. One of those inequalities, it's already proven. Which one? Hmm? At least n square or at most n square? How wise is this proven? Just look at the definition of the thing. It's n squared plus something. <laughs> right? Yeah. n squared plus something is going to be at least order of n squared. Right? Agree? Yes. Okay? So this is proved from definition of t. Right? Because it's n squared plus positive stuff means it's at least n squared times a constant. You can choose c equal 1 and then obviously true. So we need to prove what? This needs proof. You think we can do it? Well, t of n smaller than dn squared. Uh, there's a base case depending on how you choose n0. So I'm letting you figure out that at home. What would be my induction step? <coughs> This is what I want to prove. What's my induction step? If d of n by 2 is smaller than d n by 2 squared, it has to be the same form. Implies what? d n, right? I think I need something else in the induction hypothesis. I need not just that thing, I need another thing. I need the n by 4. Smaller than d of? So my induction hypothesis says what I want to prove for n, I'm assuming it's already proven for the half and for the quarter. Is that a, a, a valid induction step? Right, it's a called strong induction. Strong induction says you can assume it's proven for everybody before that n. We don't need everybody. We only need a quarter and a half. But the strong induction says everybody before that n satisfies the property. And like before, we're not concerned here with t of n by 2, t of n by 4 not being integers. There is a little appendix in the book that says if you I really concerned mathematically with the half and the quarter not being integers of how induction works. You take the floors or the ceilings and you, they say you can work it out. In this class, we don't care about that. But if you want to do theory, algorithmic theory for your PhD, you're going to have to be more rigorous than this. But in this class, we just say, <laughs> we pray half is integer, quarter is integer, works out. The, the nice monotonic function that if you take the floor and ceiling, you don't, don't change the behavior of it. So what we're going to say, strong induction from these two, I'm going to prove that one. Like before, every induction step, you have to state it first. Okay? So how am I going to prove this? T of n is who? n squared plus t of n by 2 plus t of n by 4. Now I'm applying the induction hypothesis separately for the two t's. So that's n squared plus n squared. So t of n by 2 is smaller than d n by 2 squared plus t of n by 4 is smaller than d of n by 4 squared. OK? Well, let's see what we have here. n squared is everywhere. So I can just say n squared times what? How many n squares are here? 1 plus 1 by 4. 1 
plus d by 4 plus d by 16. Sorry about my writing. I never in my life had the board so bad. D by 4 plus d in green out of all cups. And now we're back to desires, right? We want something. Want. What do we want? We want this to be smaller than? So this is uh, d n squared, right? That's what we want, of course. So that's equivalent to what? How do we get that happening? n squared with n squared can go away here. That's equivalent to say 1 plus d to the 4 plus d to the 16 has to be smaller than d. I think that's easy to make it happen. Uh, that's again a want. Don't forget to put this want if it's not proven. Let's do one more step. Let's multiply here with 16. 16 plus 4d plus d has to be smaller than 16d. This is still a one, but I think it's very easy to make this happen. There are too many d's on the right side that would beat up this left side. So right here, I can choose a d to make it work. Of course, I have to consider the base case. Make sure when you pick a d, you have to satisfy this relation, but also the base case. But that proves to me that dn squared is provable. I already have n squared because of the definition. So I got the right guess. I could not rigorously compute this, this, this. If you know a lot of combinatorics, perhaps you can write a nice sum in here and keep going with it and do it rigorously, right? If you know how to do the, the Pascal coefficients, you do a sum of Pascal coefficients with the t's and you work that sum, perhaps Again, if this is a complete mathematical argument, it's, it's okay, you can prove it like that. I found it easier, most problem, to just make a guess and do a proof by induction. So, if you don't have this rigorous, you would have to prove it separately somehow. Not necessarily by induction. The induction is typically the easiest. And remember, you may need a trick sometimes, the guess is right, but the proof doesn't work until you subtract a lower term like I did before. If this proof wouldn't work, I'll say dn squared minus dn, or maybe a different constant times n, just to see if that works. OK. So now I think we're starting to have a, a, a hold for how recurrences go. There is a recurrence. The first few things is to try it out by iterations, few steps, see what I'm getting. I make a guess at some point. Maybe I don't make a guess. Maybe I can, by brute force iterations, get it done. That's OK. If not, I make a guess eventually somewhere, either with a tree or with algebraic pattern, like before, like last time. We, we just said, <coughs> I believe the pattern is like that. So we, that's what our guess. If I can do it rigorously, I have to prove something by induction. And finally, if I can't get the theta bound, I may be forced to leave it into the best I can prove is at least n squared and at most n cubed, right? Because I can't prove the same bounds. All recurrences that are nice monotonic <coughs> functions, they are not bouncing around. They're actually some theta of something. But that something may be so complicated that we don't know how to prove it. So instead we say we prove it more than, say, at least n squared and at most n squared log n. We didn't find a theta bound, but we found close enough lower and upper bounds for it. That's still much better than saying, I have no clue what it does. Right. And now, I want to uh, show you, um, for example, this recurrence here. I'm going back to this example. Uh, do you guys remember what this one was? 4t of n by 2 plus n. So I want to do this more generally. I want to say, what if you want to do the same exact tree, if you'd like, or, or I can do the algebra. If I have a general equation, which is 
a p of n by b plus n to the c. So instead of what would be a b c here? A is four, b is two, c is one. Typically they would be integers, but what I'm doing here works even if some of them are, if c is for example 1.5, something with square roots, that would still work. But we'll do it for integers. So I can do the tree, or I can do the algebra, and I'll, I'm going to try to do both, see how far I get. If I do a tree, what happens to the t of n? How many branches is it going to have? It's going to have a branches, right? This is a branches. Again, that makes a lot of sense for the integers. It won't make <laughs> obvious sense if a is 3.7. But the general formula is going to work anyway, because again, take ceilings and floors, it's 3.7 is between 37 by 10 and 38 by 10, and then we, we're going to make it work out. Uh, each branch is going to be what? Each branch is T of n by b. This is the case where all the branches are the same. So in the, the example I have here, the problem was each one decomposes into two different branches. But in here, they all T of n by b times a to make it simple. And the load, when I do the, the load here is n to the c. So what happens if I do it again? If I start decomposing any one of these, so this is p of n by b, of course, p of n by b, p of n by b, p of n by b. Now, when I say do the second round, I'm going to decompose one of those into how many branches? Again, a branches, all of them are going to be a branches. So how is this guy going to look? This is a branches, and each branch is? B squared. Right, because b, the n by b divided by another b is b squared now. That's what happened before, right? n divided by 2 divided by 4 divided by 8. So that's here. What's going to be the load here? So first of all, how many of these guys I'm going to have? So the first branching was a branches. Now each branch splits itself into <coughs> a branches. So the total number of branches is a squared times that, right? Because it's number of branches. How much do I need to add? Every decomposition added a what term? So for, for an entire thing here, what was the free term? Somebody, hands up, one person. So when I decompose this guy, just one of t of n by b, I get a times, this a squared accounts for everybody. If I just do this, it's a, if I look from here to here, it's going to be a of them, but then there's a branches. Okay, so what's the free term in here? A C N by B to the power. So A it's not part of the free term because it's A times the decomposition. I'm talking about this. How much is this free term? That can also be multiplied by A, right? Because there's A of them, right? So it's N by B plus C. So now that's one decomposition. But I have another one here and another one here. So the total number is going to be a squared b t of n by b squared. But how? What's the load? So the total number of branches would be a squared, and the additional load would be that. Okay. What happens if I do it again? <laughs> I take one of these guys and I decompose it into A branches. 
divide and conquer. I break it into sub problems and try to solve it. What's going to be its A times T of the inside is what? Okay. And the total load is going to be what? A square. So why is it a a square n by b square to the c? So n by b square comes from the fact that I had that n by b square. And every time I do the decomposition, it's whatever the argument is at power c. But why is it a square? Because there were a square total terms, and each one of them had the free load. Hands up, who's with me here? Okay. This may be something that you want to think at home, for example, so if you apply different a, b, and c. Of course, there'll be a formula at the end, but you want to understand how this decomposition works. Now if I take any one of these guys and I decompose it again, what do I get? A branches and then each each one of them is B four. Okay? And the load here is gonna be So this is my geometric progression. Um, and I have to figure out the last <coughs> termination, right? So how far this is going to go? Where, where does it stop? This is k equal 0, k equal 1, k equal 2, k equal 3. What's the last k? How, how this whole thing? going to end up being T of 1. What K do I need to make T of 1 inside? K has to be log base K of N, right? And for that K, what do I get? I get T of 1, of course, because I choose the K so that the inside is 1. But how many is? I get a to the power k, right? Yes. But a to the power k is who? It's log base b of n. Right? And what's going to be the last load? A to the k, let's say, n to the b k. So how do we sum all this up? The last step, the stopping step, it's going to be, make sure I get it right. Uh, let's do this one first. The, the free load here is a sum from, we'll figure out what to what. Um, well, n to the c, it's everywhere. So let's put that in front of the sum, n to the c. And the sum on indices i is from, it's on a to divide by b to the c at power i, right? Because everyone, it's an a divided by b <coughs> to the c at that power, right? This is a divided by b to the c, everything yes. at power 2. Mm -hmm. This is a divided by b to the c, everything at power 3. Yes. So on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. So every one of these is, in fact, a divided by b to the c at power k. Mm -hmm. right? right, but we, what's the first and last index? It starts with... Zero, and the last one is what I, what I have here in my paper, but I don't know why. I get log base b of n minus one. 
Why is minus one? I don't know. Okay, I don't know what you guys think. You can figure out at home why is it log of b. We know it's about log of b of n, but the question is mathematically why it's not log b of n, why is log b of n minus 1 in there? It turns out in the geometric series it doesn't matter because geometric series are either bounded or go to infinity. But it's a good mathematical question. Why is log b of n minus 1? I can promise you right now, it is not my intention to ask such a question in an exam. <laughs> Why is it in master theorem that this is log b of n minus 1 and not log b of n? Because it's not a math class. I'm going to ask algorithmic questions or conceptual questions. But I'm not going to ask these mathematical details. But for those of you who are math oriented, you should figure out why, maybe my notes are wrong here. But if they're not, why is log b of n minus 1? This g last time is going to be minus 1. minus 1. This is minus 1 here? No, no, no. Yeah. 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 On the lower side, last time. A to the lower side, minus 1. Because 11 is 4th level. It starts from. There you go. I think that's it. <laughs> OK, but what about the other term? What's that? <coughs> What do we have here? We have a at log base b of n. Is that it? I'm going to make a, a speculation that a at log base b of n is the same, just this part, not that part, like n at log base b of a. Is that true? Why is it true? So what my speculation here is, let's try to write it on the side, that y is log at base b of n, uh, n at log base b of a. I think maybe we can write this as n log b at log base b of a, that's just the base, that's just a, yeah. mm -hmm. at log base b of n, right? Mm -hmm. The base a, mm -hmm. uh, apart from 1 at power 1 or 0 power 0, some, something extreme cases. Uh, in general, <laughs> log at base b of a is going to be a. Mm -hmm. So now that I have this, I can permute the logs in here. I can, right? This is. Uh, I can multiply those two, right? But I, I, because it's multiplicative, I can do it the other way. I can say this is b at log base b of n, everything at log base b of a. Because I can, the, the product of them will be the same or I do it this way or that way. And now in this form, who's b at log base b of n? n, and this is log base b of a. Hands up, follow this. Not an obvious thing, I would say. I, I know when somebody shows it to you and then explains why it is, makes total sense. But straight when you see, wait a minute, that's a typo. Was A at log B of N, now it's B at log of N. No, it's not a typo. It's actually true. So N at log base B of A plus, now how much is this? This is a geometric series with base. A by B to the C, right? So this is going to be N to the C. What's the progression here? It's, it's the sum <laughs> inside is really 1 plus R. Is really 1. What's the first term? I equals 0. That gives me 1, right? So plus R plus plus. What's the last power? Log base B of N, right? So what's the formula? R at uh, is log base b of n minus 1. Log b of n minus 1. So this would be log base b of n minus 1 down divided by r minus 1, right? If I really want to be exact about this geometry progression. So now I get this part in here is we say it's n like log base b of a, right? 
plus that thing <coughs> is n to the c. Now, what did we say the formula is going to be? R log of base b of n minus 1 divided by r minus 1. Yes. This formula works <coughs> if r is like not it. 1, because I can't divide the 0. So now I think we have cases depending of what, what's up with A at B divided by B to the C here. So I think that A uh, by B to the C could be 1. That's a case. Or could be less than 1. Right. So A by B to the C could be uh, C is smaller than something. This is bigger than one, I think. <coughs> and then A by B to the C could be smaller than one. A, B, and C are given to me. They, they part of the definition of the recurrence. So I have no control over those. Could happen any one of those three cases. Right? Because those cases would influence what the relationship does. Right? So um, let's, let's write in terms of equivalence. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to fit it in. Same line here. If I take logs, what does this mean? I think this means c is smaller than log base b of a. Is that right? This means c equal log base b of a, and this is c is bigger than log base b of a. I hope I didn't get it backwards. This is the same thing, right? A by b to the c bigger than one is the same as saying c is smaller than log base b of a. Is that right? This is saying c is equal to that, and this is saying c must be bigger than that. Uh, so in those three cases, what's up with my relation? Like, I, I know this is a general formula here, maybe for r not equal 1. I want to know what's going to happen in all those cases. So let's see. If a, the easy one maybe is this one is a by b to the c is smaller than 1. What's this, this whole thing? This is a geometric progression with r smaller than 1. So what this going to be? So let's call this like part, uh, you know, part 1 and this part 2. So in this case here, what is part 2? Geometric progression, that's a constant because r is smaller than 1. Right? r is smaller than 1. So that's a constant times? So this is going to be some theta of n to the c. How about this part? This is theta of, we have it here. So part 1 is theta of what? n at? Log base b of a. But which one is bigger, c or log base b of a? In this case, c. Right? So you guys see what I'm doing here? I have a competing thing. I get part 2. I know this is a constant, a geometric progression of some kind. It doesn't even matter how many terms I'm summing up. Because this geometric progression, even if I sum up all the terms to infinity, is going to be a constant. Times n to the c. So that's theta of n to the c. Yes. And then this I already know it's n log, b, log base b of a. And in this case, I know c is bigger. Mm -hmm. So between those two, what's going to be the answer? The answer is theta of n to the c. Because between two things, the bigger one will give the order. That's true for all polynomials. OK, making progress. What about here? What is the part one in here? That's the same, right? It's n at log base b of a. 
So now the problem is, <coughs> I really have to compute part two more exact. Because in here, I can't just say it's a geometric progression. It's limited. It's like a constant or something. Because a at b to the c being bigger than 1, mm -hmm. it's going to grow big. Of course, I have a limited number of terms. So I think I need to take that part 2 and compute it. So let's, let's call this case 1, case 2, and case 3. And let's do a side computation here for case 1. Case 1, we want part 2. What exactly is that sum? This sum in here. So n to the c is fixed. It's a common factor, right? So it's n to the c <coughs> times. Uh, the formula still applies, even if r is bigger than 1, correct? Yes. So what's the formula? Now, r is exactly a by b to the c. So it's going to be a divided by b to the c at what power? Log n base b. Log base b of n. Maybe write it bigger so you guys can see it. n to the c times what? a by b to the c. That's the base. At power? Log, log base, base b of n. Minus 1. Minus 1, right? Over? A to the C minus one. So I'm not doing part one. I'm only dealing with this sum here. My job is not necessarily to compute it exact, but to evaluate it against part one, which is n at log b of a. That, that's what I want to figure out what it is. Um, so. <laughs> There's some calculations that need to happen here. A, B to the C at log base B of N minus 1. So, um, Let's see what we can do. Can we get rid of these minus ones? So we, we think in terms of theta, right? Our, our, prior, our job here is to do a grow order of growth, not exact value. In order of theta, what is a by b to the c minus 1? That's a constant. Right? So constant gets out. This whole thing, whatever it is, it's a constant. Remember, constants don't matter for theta, so that's out. Then minus 1 here, it's going to be a minus n to the c, right? So what do we have? I'm going to have a... Wait a minute. I don't think this minus 1 is going to matter either. Because this is going to be n to the c times something. But this something, this is going to be bigger. 8 by b to the c here is bigger than 1. So then when I raise this as a logarithmic power, eventually goes to big numbers because it's a base bigger than 1. So whether I subtract 1 or not, this is going to be the dominant term. So I think this doesn't matter. Does not matter. So what do I what do I get? Here's what I have in my in my formula here. I get n to the c times a at log base b of n divided by b at c at log base b of n. Uh, that makes sense because it's a at log base b of n, b to the c at log base b of n. I got rid of minus 1, I got rid of this constant, right? Yes. So now, what? Denominator is n to c. What? Denominator is n to c. Denominator? Yeah. That is n to c. Right. 
No base B of n? So, oh, you say you know what it is, right? So this is theta of n to the c times the part on the top. We already say that's log base B of a, right? By n to the c? Is that what you guys say? Okay, so this goes away, and I get what? Log base b of a. Now I already have n at log base b of a for part one. So for part two, I have the same. So the overall result is going to be n log base b of a. So there's two things that are the same thing. How about here? So case uh, two. What's part one? <coughs> it's n at log base b of a. What is part two? <coughs> How do we do part two? We know who n to the c is. C is the same as log base b of a. So n to the c is n at log base b of a. And what's up with these internal terms in this case? One, 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 one. How many of them are there? From zero to that, this is? Log base b of n, right? Because there's this that many terms, this is the how many terms are there, in each of them is one. I cannot apply this formula because r is equal one here, but I can do it directly from just counting the sum. So which one's bigger? This is log base b of a, this is n at log base b of a times log n, the second one, right? So the overall is n at log base b of a times log of n. Remember when I say all logarithms grow the same way? Yes. So log base b of n is, in terms of order of growth, just a general <laughs> logarithm. Doesn't matter the base. Which is the same, by the way, if I don't C. like log base b of a, I could say C. C. I could say this is the same as n to the C times log n. Because log base b of a, it's exactly C. So this is called the master theorem. This is a simple version because the book does something with the generic function here. It's not just n to the c. It's the general f of n, which they have to prove some conditions about it first. I choose to prove the simple version because this is a complete proof right now. We have three cases. For n to the c. Now, in the book, if I replace this n to the c with a general f of n, there's still conditions about that. There's three cases, but one of the cases requires additional checks. <coughs> you are required to know this proof, but also <coughs> required to be able to apply the general master theorem from the book. But you're not required to know the proof of the general master theorem. So, in terms of proofs, it's enough if you know the proof for the simple version, like I did here. In terms of applications, you might get a function that's not n to the c. You get a function that's a little bit more complicated. It may still fit very well the master theorem if you satisfy the conditions for the cases, which are in the book, the Corman's book. So you have to be able to apply that. Let's let's do our example really quick. This one. What's a? What's b? What's c? <coughs> a equal four. B equal two. C equal one. What's the case? Log base b of a is what? A one. Log base b of a two. How much is log base two or four? Two. So log base b of a is bigger than c. So then the answer is? 
It's n squared because log base b of a is 2. It's this one here. What if I have n squared? That's not this anymore. What would be a? 4, b, 2, c, 2. What case is then now? Log base b of a is 2 is the same as this. So the answer will be? This would be theta of n squared log n. A very good exercise is to do this by brute force iterations. This is simple enough that you should be able to write the iterations like we did before. You don't need a guess. You can get, figure out the pattern and then drive it down rigorously. You should get n squared log n without calling the master theorem. Because the proof is going to go exactly like this three. Right? The general pattern would be a, how many is I have? t of n by, this is 2 to the k plus the load, and when you add up the load, you should get n squared log n. So that's an exercise, an exercise without master theorem. Now master theorem applies to a lot of recurrences of this form. Does it apply to this one? What was this one here? Was it n squared plus t of, plus t of n by 4? No. Does it apply to this? No. There is a more general version of the master theorem, which is somewhere in the links from the website, which says you don't really need a times t of n by b. You need a bunch of t's. You can think of this as a t of n by b's. You can break it into t of different parts, n by something, n by something, n by something. And you look at how much the parts add up to. In this case, they add up to a half plus a quarter. In general, in a simple version, they would add up to exactly what? <coughs> 1b times a. And that can be proven too. Can we divide that into two master theorems, add a term plus n to the power 0, and then take something of that first? Uh, unless you make a proof. So you have to come up with a theorem first and then prove it. Right? I, I, I don't think as a recurrence you can. I mean, I have to see what you have, but I don't think it can be broken into some p of n by 2s and p of n by 4s and apply for both of them, the master theorem. In order to do this application, like in here, you have first to prove the theorem, and then you can apply it. So now, this is a complete proof of master theorem, the simple version, which I may ask you some question in the exam about it. But if I do ask, it's going to be about this version, not the one in the book. Some questions in your homework require the more general version from the book as an application. But the last problem, which is the uh, next to last, I think, right? it's not the last one. It's the next to last one. That's easy, because you don't have to think too hard. You just have to figure <laughs> out what case of the master theorem is. You may get things like, uh, say, for example, 3 n by 7 plus uh, n square root n. Is that master theorem? Yeah. What is c? 3 by 5. 2.5? So I can still apply the master theorem here. Yeah. Don't get tricked by the form because it's still master theorem. But I have one that we didn't have time to. This is online. What about the following one? I'm not going to do it because we, we don't have time. Here's a recurrence. T of n is uh, T of n 4, like before, T of n by 2 plus n squared divided by log of n. Can I apply the master theorem? Certainly not this one. I cannot apply this master theorem. This master theorem requires a n at power c. You can read this note that I have here. This is proven without master theorem. It's with iteration, guessing, and proof by induction. Or you can try to figure out a more general version, maybe the one from the book that's a general f of n, 
maybe you can prove the condition about that f of n and then apply that master theorem. But I think this is hard. This would have to be done by hand. Maybe we'll do it next time in class. Maybe not. So with that, I think you have everything you need to do the homework. By the way, two important announcements. Homework is due when? When is that? Monday. Will be, I think, due on Wednesday morning or something like that. Because I feel like you know, you guys that don't have enough time to digest this master theorem. I think it's easy, but I don't want to book your weekend with it. So that's a small announcement. It's not going to be Monday morning. Maybe it'll be Wednesday morning. The more important exam uh, announcement is that I've got the exam, the midterm date wrong. I think I announced 224. Yes. I think that's a Saturday, and it's not good that Saturday for our schedule. It's gonna, I think, gonna be the next Saturday, which is March what? Second or third? The only question I have for you: that weekend, March second is just before the spring break. So there's that Saturday, and I think officially the first spring break day is the next Sunday. My question is, any one of you already bought plane tickets for the spring break, aka you booked that Saturday and cannot do the exam? Is it any person? Spring break, as, as far as it starts from Sunday, March 4th, it won't affect the exam. It will actually feel pretty good as a spring break after the midterm. <laughs> <laughs> sure. My question is, is there anyone here who already booked the Saturday as part of the spring break that has, uh, you know, I cannot make that Saturday? In a way that you cannot undo your plans? If I say the midterm, I just book yesterday, I guess I can cancel Will you book a flight to far away? Can, can you move it to I Sunday? On that Saturday? On every Saturday. Yeah. Oh, but that, that for you so won't matter if it's that Saturday, Saturday or the next Saturday. You're going to have to take one lecture off, I'm afraid, because the exam. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This exam fits much better on Saturday than during the week because it's long and because we won't find a room during the week anyway. You guys have to make so I'm going to go ahead with that day, and if you cannot make it, we'll figure out a um, follow-up exam, version B, something. But I think it will be easier if you guys can make it. Uh, most professors will, will understand. Okay. Can you get back to me whether you can delay the flight to Sunday? I'm sorry about this, but it cannot be done on 224. It's going to be the next Saturday. That's March. On the right side, right side.